revelation that Daniel receives. He saw his last vision in chapter 10. Then the revelation of understanding comes to him in, in chapter 11. And then the conclusion of the vision comes in chapter 12. So chapter 10, 11, and 12 is all one vision of Daniel, one prophecy, one prophetic utterance, one revelation, and then it brings the book of Daniel to a close. And I guess it would be only be fitting then that, that the hardest would be saved to the last. I don't think it was too hard as we began the book of Daniel to start in chapter 2 and realize that there was going to be uh, four Gentile empires. A fifth would be like the fourth, but then the, the four, which we, we would actually just number them five, five world empires that would rule until Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his authority, his reign upon the earth. That was kind of easy to see. In, in, in fact, that's the very basics of Bible prophecy. It's the, the very elementary things concerning prophecy in your Bible. It all centers around the Lord Jesus Christ coming and establishing his kingdom upon this earth. But now as we come over here, we begin to, to see that there is uh, some things involved in that coming that are very complicated. One that I'll just tell you offhand, that while I would like to speak with absolute authority, uh, I know that the Bible is absolutely right about these things. I just don't know what it means. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, you know, it's funny, too. I'll, I'll share with you another time, but it is interesting. If you read the first verse of Daniel chapter 10, Daniel said he had understanding. And when it's all done, Daniel says, I don't understand. And uh, that's kind of like what it is with me. I, I understand, but I don't understand. And uh, so there is a way you can do both at the same time. And, and if I can get you that far, I'm, I'll be proud. <laughs> that would be good enough for me. But you noticed in, in Jan Daniel chapter 10, it's centered around the vision that Daniel saw the Lord Jesus Christ in his coming glory. And, and it just about killed Daniel. And in, a, in a way, it seemed like Daniel had died. And the angel keeps touching him and strengthening him just to give Daniel enough strength so then he can now communicate to Daniel the revelation that goes behind the vision that Daniel saw. And, and, and he explained in that why it took him 21 days to get to Daniel as Daniel was praying and fasting concerning the nation of Israel and God's dealings with Israel, why it took the angel 21 days to get there. He was hindered, if you recall, from what the Bible called the Prince of Persia. And uh, as we realize that it took Michael the archangel to free Gabriel, if that's the angel who's speaking to Daniel, to, to free Gabriel from the Prince of Persia, you realize we're not talking about a, a human prince that's on the earth. We're talking about an angelic prince of the heavens, which the Bible does say that there are principalities and powers in heavenly places. There is dominions. There is government in the heaven. There are two, two forces of angels that are in the heaven. Demonic angels, those who have followed Satan in, in fall and rebellion against God, and holy angels that are still standing with God. And there are wars that go on in heaven, and Satan is not down in hell, and the demons are not in hell with pitchforks. Those things are, are, are just fantasy. The devil is real. He's alive. He's free. There's coming a time where in the second coming of Jesus Christ, the devil will be bound in a, lake of, in a, in a bottomless pit. A thousand years later, he'll be cast into the lake of fire. But there's a long time until that comes. The devil is free. And when, when Gabriel, the angel, had trouble getting to Daniel, it's because there was angelic hindrance. And that that angelic world has a definite effect upon the world that we live in. And it's interesting that in this age of grace, this world that we live in has a definite effect upon the angelic world, all by the grace of God. But when you come to the end of Daniel chapter 10, we read this in verse 19. <clears throat> And he said, o, o man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. And he said, and, and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. So Daniel is strengthened by the angel, and now he says, okay, go ahead and give me the revelation. Verse 20, it says, then said he, knowest thou wherefore I am come to thee? In other words, Daniel, do you remember the things that you've been praying about? you remember the vision you saw? You get all those things in mind. Remember now what it is that I'm here to deliver to you. And it says, And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. And, and uh, excuse me, but will, but will thee, 
that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. He's talked about in Daniel chapter 12, Michael is, as the, the, the prince that stands for the nation of Israel. If there is a demonic prince that has some attachment to the Persian government, then, then the Bible makes it clear that Michael is Daniel's prince. He's the nation of Israel's prince. He is the angelic being who's fighting in the angelic realm in behalf of the nation of Israel. But it's interesting here in verses 20 and 21, he, as before he gives him the interpretation, he makes him think again why he's here and, that, and also tells him that not only did he, did he explain earlier verses, for instance, um, verse 12, it says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words." But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand. And so there was a delay in this angel making his way to Daniel. And, and so what, what he explains to Daniel is not only was there a delay coming, but now I'm here and I'm about to share with you what's in the scriptures of truth. But even before he tells him what's in the scripture to truth, he also tells him that when I leave you, I got to go back and fight. I got to go fight the king of, of the prince of Persia. And then he goes on to explain in verse in chapter 11, verse 1. Also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And so he's explaining to Daniel that the things that are transpiring, there's some first angelic wars, and those angelic wars have an effect on the earth. Now, what he does is that kind of explains to Daniel how this angel can tell him what's in the scripture of truth. There's already uh, an explanation. The in heavens already have the testimony of God of what's going to happen. And they're working through those things in the heaven, and those things are working its place out, its time and place on this earth, working those things out on the earth. And the angel is able to explain to Daniel that I'm going to go and fight. Um, for instance, in verse 2 of chapter 11, And now I will show you the truth, Oh, no, that's not what I want. But verse 20 of chapter 10. It says, Then he said, Knowest thou wherefore I am come? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall, shall come. See, he already knows what's going to come. He knows who he's got to fight with now. And he knows when he's done fighting what's going to take place, who's going to come in in, in, the, in the heavenly realm. And as a result of that, you're going to learn in chapter 11, it ends up happening on earth that same way. And so there's things in the angelic world that are going on there. Now, I don't want to get too much into the angelic world, but just because the information is here, I thought it'd be good to look at it. Back in verse 11, uh, verse, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 13. No, excuse me, folks. <laughs> chapter 10, I got this 12 in my mind, verse 13. I want you to realize that a lot of times people think that Gabriel, this angel, is fighting Persia. And as I look at this, I don't think he is. Notice it says in verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, I don't think in the Bible a prince is a king. I think a prince is someone who is to be king, part of the royal line, someone who has some power in the kingdom, but he's not on the throne. He's not the king. And, and it says here, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Below Michael, one of the chief prince, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. As if there is a prince who's causing some troubles with Gabriel, and as, it's as if Gabriel is then taken and thrown in prison for 21 days. I, I think this is how I see it, that he has been delayed 21 days. We know there's a delay and this prince of Persia delayed him, but when he was delayed, he remained somewhere, and it says he remained with the kings of Persia. As if there is a royal line and there's a prince that's causing trouble. The reason I say that is when you come back now over to verse 21, or verse 20 again, it says, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I am come to thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. So he's, he's back, he's got a, Michael freed him, he came, but he's going to go back and finish fighting with that prince of Persia and probably free up the other kings of Persia. Because when you get into chapter 11, look at chapter 11, verse... 
And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall yet uh, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength and through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. See, there's going to be more kings of Persia, but this prince is stopping these other kings from being able to come in and take their place in the reign of Persia. And there is an evil, demonic prince of Persia, but the, the kings of Persia are not necessarily evil. They seem to be held captive by this prince. And, and Gabriel, after he's done dealing with Daniel, is going to go back, destroy that prince, and free up the, the kings of Persia and allow them to come and to reign in the order that God has determined to allow them to reign and to accomplish the things he would have them accomplish. I say that to you because it's interesting when you study the Gentile powers. Out of, out of the five, if you call the Antichrist kingdom, the final, the revived Roman Empire, the fifth Gentile power, out of the five, only one of them ever seems to be on Israel's side. When you come to the media Persian Empire, they're always blessing Israel. They're the ones, it's the Persian king that allowed Israel to go back and to rebuild and even finance the building of the temple. And it's interesting, when you read the book of Ezra, that Ezra goes back and, and they rebuild the temple under Zer, the foundation under Zerubbabel, but after they laid the foundation, all of a sudden there became trouble to the nation of Israel. Some, some people stirred up some trouble, wrote back to the capital of Persia and, and, and said these people are trying to, to rebuild the city so that they can defy the, the realm of, of Persia. And the king looked back and said, oh yes, these are rebellious people. And he stopped the rebuilding of the temple and the people from being blessed and to continue to do what God called them back to the land to do. So there's a human king that's out of all the kings of Persia, one stopped the rebuilding of the temple and the blessings from coming to Israel. But it's not long after that, you read in Ezra chapter 4, that another king gets, finally gets on the throne. When he gets on that throne, he reevaluates the situation, saw there was a prior decree to allow Israel to, to rebuild, and he orders the rebuilding again, and blessing comes back to Israel. Doesn't that kind of match what's going on here? Here there's an evil prince that's working against Daniel, Israel, from getting God's revelation. And then Michael comes, frees Gabriel, he comes, and now he's going to give Daniel the information, but when he leaves, he's going to go back and take care of that prince of Persia. And when he takes care of that prince of Persia, it's going to free up other kings to get on, on the throne in Persia, kings that are actually going to act in behalf of the nation of Israel. And so, as I look at that, I begin to realize the kings of Persia are seem, seem to be in captivity with Gabriel in prison, and then he's free, and he's going to go back and free them up so that they can continue on to rule in the, in the, the times of the Persian Empire. Is that confusing? Do you see that? Uh, I, I think it's real clear. It's not confusing? Thank you. I, I thought it was clear. I never saw that that way before, but as I looked at these, I began to see what was going on. What is real interesting and very basic is that it says there in verse, 30, in verse 21 of chapter 10, but I will show thee. Now, he knows what's going to happen. How does he know what's going to happen? He knows he's got to fight. He knows after he's done fighting for the kings of Persia and he gives up on the kings of Persia that someone else is going to take over according to verse 20, uh, 20 there, the king of Greece is going to come and take over. He knows that. How does he know all this? He says, I will show thee what is noted in the scripture of truth. You know, not only is there an angelic world, an angelic war is going up there, there's a Bible up there. He's coming down to reveal to Daniel what Daniel is going to put in our Bible. But there's already, when it says scriptures, that's writings. And there is somehow a scripture of truth that this angel knows about, and he's going to communicate it to Daniel, and it's going to get written down so that we have it, a Bible on earth. And, and he comes down there and communicates. He knows these things because they're written in the scriptures of truth. And that angelic Bible, if there's such a thing up there, this angel Gabriel, when he considers the scriptures, the writings of God, you know what he calls them? He calls them truth. He don't, err, he don't dare think that something that God wrote down isn't going to happen exactly like God said it. He believes it. And he communicates it to Daniel. And it's now written in our scriptures of truth because they're identical. We have a complete revelation of God now. Uh, in fact, their revelation, if there's a Bible in heaven, I know that the, the epistles of Paul weren't written for Gabriel to read. They were a mystery hidden God. 
uh, until revealed to the Apostle Paul, and then the manifold wisdom of God is known to the angelic world, a mystery that was never known prior. But these scriptures are prophetic scriptures, scriptures of truth that he's going to explain to Daniel what's going to happen in the ages to come, in the time that's going to come. You know, if that's true, doesn't that give you a whole different idea? Come here, come back to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. I want to show you some other verses, but I want you to go first to verse 89. Psalms 119, verse 89. And David writes, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now, doesn't that have a whole new meaning to you now? (laughs) There's a heavenly Bible. God's word is known in the heavens, and it's being made known on the earth. That's what prophecy is all about. The God, what he knew and what he wrote is being made known. And it's interesting, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled for he- in heaven. Not just the things that God promised to do, not just uh, 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 some kind of a, uh, agreement that God made and, and it's settled in his heart type of thing. There's a word of God that's known. There's a scripture of truth, and it's settled in heaven. And it's just gonna it's just gonna happen in time on the earth, and God's word will be fulfilled. You know, Psalms 119 is all about the word of God. Uh, just come back, Psalms 119. Just a couple verses that has blessed me concerning the word of God, and realized just that verse how it's settled in heaven, how that could relate to Daniel chapter 10, verse 20 and 21. But other verses about just about the Bible, the word of God in Psalms 119. For instance, in verse 9. It says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How do you have a pure life? How does a, how does a young man, if you're young here, this verse is talking about you. How is it that a young man can have a clean way of living? What, what is it that's going to be able to help you not get into bad things, not get into evil things, not get into things that are going to destroy your life? What is it that's going to work in your life? Wherewithal will a young man cleanse his way? The answer, by taking heed Thereto, according to thy word. You have to listen to the Bible. You have to hear it. That means not daydreaming in a preaching service. That means taking some time during the during everyday activity of life to read God's word and to get God's word in your mind. For instance, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know what it's going to take? for you to overcome temptation it's going to take you to have some understanding about God and what God has said not just mental understanding not just understanding why you're sitting here but understanding that goes down into your heart becomes part of your being and wherever you go it's there there's a verse of scripture there's an understanding about spiritual warfare and battles and and sin and how sin always calls ruin and decay and death and misery Uh, having that understanding deep inside your heart and carrying that with you where you go, it'll, it'll keep your way cleansed and it'll keep you from sin because you'll have it down in your heart, not just on a book in front of you. Verse 18 says, Open mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Israel's Bible was per, pretty much the law, as, as here's David, is just now writing the Psalms. And so when they consider their Bible, show me wondrous things out of thy law, out of his word. And, you know, that ought to be our attitude as we come every time we come to church. We ought to, we ought to take that verse, memorize it, and make it a prayer. And pray it before we come in to a service and ask God, uh, help me not just to be here filling time, passing a half hour, an hour, 45 minutes, whatever. But help me to be here to learn wondrous things out of thy word. Verse 24 says, thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Do you get your counsel from God's word? And uh, I'm not going to take any more time, but these gems are just all the way, all the way through Psalms 119. It'd be valuable for you, the longest chapter in the Bible. It'd be worth it for you to sit down and read it, and mar- perhaps mark some of these, because when you mark it and look at it a little bit more closely, it'll go beyond your mind. It'll start working its way into your heart. But anyhow, verse 89 was that verse that says, "Forever, O Lord, Thy word is settled in heaven." God's word is a settled fact. It's a scriptures of truth. It's going to happen. And so an angel can come and tell Daniel what's going to take place. Come back now to chapter 11 of Daniel. There's the things that took place in heaven. And now 
Now he's ready to tell, tell Daniel what's going to take place. Um, it says in verse 1 of 11, Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. He's, he's already, what he's doing, in order to explain to Daniel how he knows what's going to take place in the future, he, already, he goes back to time in, in Daniel chapter 5 when Darius the Mede came and conquered Babylon. And you recall that's when Belshazzar, Belteshazzar was having his party, no Belshazzar, was having his party and the handwriting on the wall came that night. And, and the handwriting on the wall basically said your kingdom's over, it's going to be given to the, to the Medes and the Persians. And that night, here comes Darius marching underneath the wall, conquered the kingdom of, of Babylon. Now how did that happen? Well, we know how it happened in the physical realm. We can even study it in history books. But there was something settled in heaven concerning those things, and there were some angelic uh, happenings that we didn't know about. According to this verse, while that was going on, this angel that's talking to Daniel says, Also I, even in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Angelic beings were, were there. happening. These things were taking place by, by means of an angelic help that wasn't known to man. Verse 2 says, And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. And so he says there's going to be actually four kings of Persia that's going to follow. Now it's interesting, not to me, <laughs> It's, the fact is, is interesting that it's hard for people when they study history to know exactly what four kings this is talking about. Because there's a lot of kings that stood up even after this point in Daniel's history. Daniel tells you when he's writing in chapter 10 and verse 1, it's the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. And it's hard to come up with four kings after Cyrus that, that Daniel could be referring to. Now, I don't know if that's a problem in history uh, a problem in study, a, a problem in understanding, I don't know. I, I, all I know is I was going to write down their names and share you their names, but I don't know which names to write down. And uh, so, But I do know that the Bible says, and this is the scripture of truth, there's going to be four that shall stand up. And the fourth one's going to be rich, and by his riches, he's going to go, he's going to, his goal is to wipe out Greece. Greece is going to become a threat to the media Persian Empire, and the last one, his goal is to wipe it out. Notice in verse 3, and a mighty king shall stand up. Now what that's talking about, I know, is the king of Greece. This last Persian king is going to go up against the king of Greece. He's going to lose. We've learned that in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8. So we know this. In verse 3, all of a sudden we've gone now from four kings of Persia to the king of Greece. And a mighty king shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. Now, I'm going to stop there. We realize, I want to point out to you in just a little bit that I know that that's the king, the king of Greece who's going to win over the media Persian Empire from previous study. But this has given me a clue about what it means in verse 2 about four kings standing up. When it says the four kings shall stand up, notice verse 3 says, and a mighty king shall stand up. You know, I never noticed all the time we were reading the book of Daniel how often that word stand up, stand up, stand up. And you know what it means? It doesn't mean, of course, it doesn't mean he's going to stand up like no one else ever stood up. It means that he's going to stand for something or he's going to stand up to accomplish something. And there may be many kings of Persia, but four of them stood up to accomplish something. And we know what the last one's going to stand up to accomplish. He's going to stand up to accomplish the wiping out of Greece. And he's not going to do it, is he? Because we already know from chapter 10 that Gabriel's not going to help Persia anymore. He's going to go away. And when he goes away, the king of Greece is going to come and conquer. And so, and so we know that Greece is going to take over. But when you say stand up, like in verse 3, then another king stands up. He stands up to conquer. And what does he do? He stands up and has dominion and he does according to his will. That's someone who's standing for something. You know, we can you know, use that term with us as well. Do you stand for something? Will you be a Christian who's known as someone who stands up? And the idea is not just any old person, but someone who's going to stand up to accomplish something. And you know, you know that's interesting because you know what you do after you accomplish something? You sit down. 
And what does that mean? That means it's over. Come over with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, first of all. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 says, God, who at sundrous times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to, unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, before Jesus Christ came the first time, there is implied in that very statement that Jesus Christ, who lived in the throne room of heaven with God the Father, he had a glory with God the Father, left heaven's glory, but when he left heaven's glory, what did he have to do? He had to stand up and leave, didn't he? He had to stand up and, and come to accomplish something on this earth. And according to those words in these, these, of these verse, not only did, did God use him to create the world, is he the part of the Godhead, the God who created the heavens and the earth? He is the, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, who being in the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. That's what he came to do the first time. He came in and he purged our sins. He bore the punishment. He paid the debt of our sins. He purged us of our sins. He took them away. And when he had by himself purged our sins, what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's the end of the first coming of Jesus Christ. He came to be a savior of the world. And when he was done, he sat down. Now that's significant. Come over to chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. He came to do his father's will, the previous verses tell us. And in chapter 10, verse 10, it says, By the which will? The will of God the Father. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ as soon as you believe, but not after you sin again. <laughs> well, this is a very important verse of Scripture that you need to see. When Jesus Christ purged your sin and sat down, does he ever have to get up and purge your sins again? No, what he did was something he did once for how long? For all. It's for all. He died for all people, but he died for all sin for all time. That's why he came to fulfill the will, his Father's will. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Isn't it nice to know that the salvation work of Jesus Christ is permanent? It's eternal salvation and that when you believe you're eternally secure in Christ that's why you are, because he died once for all. But notice the contrast to that. When he thinks about the Old Testament priests who used to offer sacrifices, it says, And every priest standeth daily, ministering and off offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. See, in the Old Testament, a priest had daily work to do. Not only was there the annual day of atonement, but every day there's the morning and the evening sacrifice. And you know what a priest had to do? He had to get up out of bed, <laughs> but he had to get off from sitting around, and he had work to do. He had to go and offer the same sacrifice often, over and over again. You came in and offered a sacrifice, and so I helped you do your sacrifice, and I go to sit down, and someone else walks in the temple. Oh, you got a sacrifice. Okay, another sacrifice. Always offering these sacrifices, and those sacrifices could never take away sins. He'd get awful tired of standing, wouldn't he? Just always standing, standing, standing. His work is never done. Why? It couldn't take away sins. But now look at the next verse. But this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, that's plural, that's all those sins of the world, By this, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God. Now, forever, is he always going to sit at the right hand of God? No. No. But concerning sacrifice for sins, he forever sat down. The idea there is there's no more sacrifice for sins. He, he went, he died for the sins of the world, and he went and sat down, and there can't be another person to walk in and say, well, what about my sins? And he's got to get up and do it all over again. 
He don't have to because when he died for sins, he died once for all sins, for all mankind, and he forever, regarding sins, sat down at the right hand of the Father. He's done. He can rest. His work is over. Verse 14, for by one, for one, by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And you know how you're sanctified? It's through faith in Christ Jesus. God wants you to believe the work that Jesus Christ did. Interesting, if you come back to Hebrews chapter 3, this idea about sitting and standing and then how Christ, when he came the first time, provided salvation and then sat down. Why? It's over. You know what you do when you sit down? You rest. And it's interesting in Hebrews chapter, did I say 3? Go to 4. Hebrews chapter 4. just want you to get the idea of some of these verses. It says in verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest. Any of you should seem to fall short of it. Not entering into your rest. You want to enter into His rest. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. The only prophet, the only time scriptures profit you is when you believe God. There is no prophet unless you believe God. There is no salvation in all that Jesus Christ did for you. There is no salvation for you until you believe what God did for you. It didn't profit them because they didn't believe. And, and these people are being asked to enter into his rest by faith. Verse 3 says, for, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he has said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now there's an analogy given here. Jesus Christ who made the world, he took six days and made the worlds, and then when he was done, the seventh day is called the day of rest. Why? Is he got to make any more world? <laughs> the world's created, the heavens and earth are created, nothing more to make. He's done, so he rested. Now, the analogy from that is that he came back into the world and he died for sins and then he went back and he rested. Because why? All the sins for mankind is now paid for. And now if you just drop down to verse, uh, uh, verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he saith, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us therefore labor to enter into his rest, lest any man fall short of the same example of unbelief. In other words, Jesus Christ, when he created, then he rested. When he came in to provide salvation, he rested. Now, you want to enter into his rest. And how do you enter into his rest? Well, according to verse 10, it says, For he that entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works. You know how you rest now in the salvation? By faith, you believe what Jesus Christ has done for you, that he's done it all, he's done it forever, he's done it permanently, he's sufficient, it's all complete. That's why he's sitting down. And now he says, enter into his rest. And how do you do that? You give up trying to do something yourself. Say, if he did it all, that's good, I'm sitting down, I'm done. Concerning works for salvation, sit down. Don't do nothing. Rest in his finished work. He's done. He's resting. And you're, by faith, you rest in his finished work and the salvation is yours. And so you can enter into his rest. Come back to Hebrews chapter, excuse me, Daniel chapter 9. And I'll share with, with you what I propose to help you to see in, in the weeks to come. It's Daniel chapter 11. <laughs> we realized as we read verse 2 there, that the Medes and Persians are going to rule. Then as we read verse 3 and began into verse 4, that the king of Greece is going to arise and, and rule. We know from Daniel chapter 7, and I'll have to just share this another time, but in Daniel chapter 7, when we studied the, the Medes and the Persians rule and then Greece ruled, it makes it real clear that, that in, the, in the realm of the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great stands up, he conquers the media Persian Empire, and he rules, and when he is great, he falls. He's di he dies. He dies at a very young age. And that his kingdom is divided into four. 
Now, when we studied that in Daniel chapter 8, we immediately realized that there was a hint there about the Antichrist because it immediately talks about out of the division of the Grecian Empire, an Antichrist arises. Almost like it skips the Roman Empire and jumps right into the, the last empire, into the Antichrist Empire, and we find the same pattern happening here in Daniel chapter 11. Verse 4 says this. It says, And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his pros- posper- posterity, not his children, not his family, nor according to his dominion, that is, the, the other, it's not going to be divided and be as great as he was, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even of others besides those, and the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above uh, above him and have dominion, and his dominion shall, shall be a great dominion. What I want you to see and, and start to think about, and we'll develop as time goes, is that when you leave verse 4, we understand history covered until verse 4. But then at verse 4, all of a sudden, we get down in verse 5 and we got a king of the south, and then there's a king of the north. And as you go down from verse 5 all the way through the end of this chapter, the north and the south, fighting and fighting, north and south, and you can't hardly figure out who wins the battles, there's at least seven different campaigns, wars against the north and the south. And there is between verse 5 and verse uh, 20, at least or it looks to be five different kings of the north. We know from Daniel chapter 8, the Antichrist is coming out of the king of the north. And, and what, what's happening here is a whole bunch of information that when you read the books about Daniel, they, they, most of the books say that what's happening between verses 5 all the way to verse 35 is things that took place after Greece and when Rome ruled and Antiochus Epiphanes and all, all things that took place. They think it's all past history that's already been fulfilled. But I want you to see, and so that you can go home and study, that there's something wrong with that thinking. Look at verse 21. Here's one of the kings of the north. And in his estate, he, the one dies and the other one's going to take his place, in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom but he shall come in peaceably and attain the kingdom by flattery. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overthrown from before him, and he shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Isn't that when the 70th week of Daniel begins? When the, when the people of the prince come and sign a treaty? That's Daniel chapter 9. And all of a sudden in verse 21, we got the beginning of the tribulation period. Look over in verse 31. And his arms shall... Uh, and, and and arms shall stand up on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. When does that happen? That's the middle of trib. The people who say these things are past history that's already taken place in the past have missed the beginning of the trib in verse 21 and the, the middle of the trib in verse 31. So what I want you to understand is if, the verse, if verse 21 begins the time of the tribulation, then from verse 5 to 20 is a time that precedes the beginning of the tribulation period. And I showed you before there was a gap in the prophetic program after the 69th week. There is a mystery gap in which we live today that's not part of prophecy, so this isn't talking about that gap. There apparently is another gap after the rapture of the church And before the tribulation begins, and what's going to take place in this time period is written down for us in verses 5 through 20. And if we watch close, we'll be able to tell what's soon to appear in our newspapers. And we'll we'll be gone before that takes place. I just tell you in close that in Daniel chapter 24, the Lord Jesus Christ warned Israel that perilous times are coming. These verses talk about a king of the north and a king of the south. North of Israel, south of Israel, constant warfare. Guess, guess who's caught in between? The nation of Israel is right in between. Perilous times are coming for them. And you know why these times are coming? He said, all day long did I stretch my hands out to a disobedient, gainsaying people. Behold, your temple is left unto you desolate. They wouldn't respond in faith to their Messiah. And so peace is withdrawn and wrath is going to come. And I tell you this, although we don't live in that, any of these prophetical gaps, I do tell you this, that in this age of God's grace, when he's given you an opportunity to be saved and promised you that in the rapture to be saved from the wrath to come, that if you ignore the salvation of God, 
The things that are written in Daniel chapter 5 through, for, through 20 and even all the way through to the end, you're going to be left to experience that yourself and to go through a time of God's wrath upon the earth if you become a gainsaying people, a people that to the truth of God's word, if you neglect to enter into the rest of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because after he sat down, he rested. But when you come to the beginning of the tribulation, you know what he's going to do? Revelation chapter 1, Jesus Christ is standing again because he's got something else to accomplish in its wrath. While he's sitting, enter into his wrath, rest so that you can be delivered from the wrath to come. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I pray that the verses of your scripture might be as real to us as it was to, to Daniel as he talked to Gabriel and as real to Gabriel as he could see the unseen world and as certainly as set his eyes upon you. Father, may we take the eyes of faith and believe the information you gave us in Scripture and realize that your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into this earth one day to accomplish something and he sat down when it was all over because it's eternally accomplished. The full, complete payment for our sins is done. And Father, I pray that people will enter into his rest by giving up their works and trusting in what he has done by faith and be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And Father, why may they enter into his rest now before he stands up again to judge this world. And so we give our thanks for this time of gap before the wrath comes and the promise of being delivered from the wrath to come through faith in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Give good judgment to each to trust that word and to believe it and to understand the words that you've given us in prophecy. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.